morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I know some of you had a mouthful of donuts, so I apologize for that. But thank you all for being here today. I appreciate not only the our public school colleagues that are here, and some of you I know drove from a significant distance to be here, so thank you for that. And also, I appreciate seeing all the students here from ENMU to also participate in this event. So thank you all very much for being here. My goal today is essentially this. I hope that everything that I say today is going to be something that you can use immediately on Monday in your rehearsals. And if it's not exactly what I say or suggest, then it's like one deviation from that or with a slight adjustment. Hopefully it's going to be something that you're going to be able to incorporate into your classrooms and into your conducting and your teaching. The way I've structured this morning is the, the idea of this clinic this morning is the three circles of conducting. And just to dispel any myths, uh, we're not talking about Miyagi and wax on, wax off, or anything like that when we're talking about three circles of conducting. This is essentially an idea that I got from Jim Collins, who's a famous uh, author and writes a lot of books for business and leadership. And he has a what I think is a fantastic book. If you have not, if you're not familiar with this, I encourage you to find this. It's called uh, Good to Great uh, by Jim Collins. And in that book, he talks very vividly about using three circles, and the intersection of that is, uh, you know, the, at the heart of being good to great in terms of a business or a corporation and things like that. So I'm going to get the first uh, presentation up here. And as you can see, uh, one of my favorite sayings is everything relates to everything. And I know even though any, many of you are either music educators or teaching with bands, uh, some of you are going to be future music educators, but it's entirely possible that some of you, in fact, let me just ask, is there anybody in here who's teaching anything other than band right now? Okay, awesome. And the reason I titled this particular presentation, Score Study for the Busy Band Director with these caveats, is that whether someday you might be finding yourself in a choral situation, orchestral situation, and or jazz situation, everything that I'm going to talk about in this particular presentation is going to be applicable to all of those genres. So when we start talking about the three circles of, the condu of conducting, one of the things that I asked the conducting class here on Thursday at ENMU was, what is your definition of music? I know, just a light topic on a Saturday morning, I know, but uh, think about that in the privacy of your own thoughts for a moment. What is the definition of music? And if you were at the lecture on Thursday, you can't answer. You keep that to yourself. The reason I start with this question is when I was a public school band director, I was in, my very first job was in rural Missouri. It was an hour north of Kansas City. I had about 40 or so in the high school band. And the town, the community, it was called Maysville, still is called Maysville. Uh, it was 1,100 people. It was a small two-way school in Missouri. And the superintendent used to be a former music educator. And before we had even started the school year, he pulled me aside and said, you know, Mr. Oliver, tell me a little bit about, you know, just your philosophy on things. And he said, I get this question a lot from parents. He said, what is music? And he asked, what's your definition of that? Well, I had just finished a master's degree, actually my second master's degree, and I was had all this philosophy stuff rolling around in my head as far as all these isms and reconstructionism and formalism and all this stuff. And I just started regurgitating all this like verbal diarrhea <laughs> to, to him. And, and after about three polite minutes, uh, he, he gently stopped me and said, I, I, I can't say that to a parent. I need a succinct definition. Thing I can say to someone that they're like, oh, I get it. So I thought about it for a little bit, and my fifth grade band director, Bradley B. Moore, may he rest in peace, always gave this, this definition that he inculcated into us about how music is a timed art of sounds and silences. The end. I was like, okay. And I said that to the superintendent, and he was immediately satisfied. I was like, good, thank you. And I, and I actually heard him over uh, at a basketball game about six months later talking to a parent, he actually said that, I kind of overheard it. I was like, okay, that's good, I'm glad that that stuck. So I've tried to incorporate that sort of 
mentality when we talk about these sorts of questions like, you know, what is conducting and score study and some other things. So back to the three circles. I think of conducting as, as a Venn diagram of three circles. And the first circle, which is what this first clinic is going to be about, is musicianship and score study. What we'll focus on today during the clinic will be the score study piece. But musicianship is essentially what, as you all know, what you bring to the process of music making with your students. For those of you that are undergraduate students, you need to get as good as you possibly can on playing your instrument. You need to be as proficient as you are possibly able to be on your instrument. And I, I say that because there's this notion about, well, I'm not going to be a performance major, or I'm not going to audition for the Chicago Symphony, so I don't need to, you know, whatever. No, you don't. Your foundation of your teaching and your foundation of being able to lead an ensemble, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of most people, is based on your fundamental musicianship. And how are you going to build that through study, practice of your own primary instrument, whether that's a winter percussion instrument, a string instrument, your voice, <coughs> whatever. Okay? So the first circle. The second circle, rehearsal techniques, planning, and pedagogy. Within this also deals with repertoire selection. The idea of you encounter a problem in your rehearsal. How do you deal with it? How do you fix it? When we get to the second part of the clinic today, I'll talk about how some fixes are very quick. Some fixes take a long time. And young teachers don't often have the experience and or large set of tools by which to come at a particular problem from lots of different angles. Whereas an experienced teacher will have that. And so the idea of what tools do we have, what tools do we use to try to solve rehearsal issues that come up. And then finally, podium presence and gestural vocabulary. When I was a young conductor, and I didn't know any better, that's what I thought conducting was. Everything that a conductor did was through gestures. The older I've gotten, and hopefully a more experienced and maybe a little bit wiser, depending on the day, is gestures are important. What we have to say through gesture, vocabulary, and podium presence is important, but it is only one part of a much larger equation when it comes to conducting and being an effective music educator. So from my point of view, the intersection of all of this, or the intersection of these three circles, is conducting. Because we've all known people that perhaps might look fantastic on the podium. They may have the absolute supreme, sublime, artistic gestures, but the group in front of them sounds like a flaming dumpster fire <laughs> because they don't know how to rehearse. And vice versa. You probably have had, it within your own experiences, you probably have known people that are fantastic rehearsal technicians and they have ears so good that they can hear the grass grow. <laughs> But you try to watch them, and it's just like a discombobulated mess. Okay? So the intersection of all of this, from my point of view, <coughs> is conducting. So the goal today is to spend some time within each of these three circles that will hopefully give you some ideas, strategies, techniques that you can use on Monday to be able to incorporate into your classrooms. So the first circle, musicianship and score study. I feel passionate about this particular topic because most people in, in my experience, and I'm still not sure I know exactly what it is, but I've done it enough that I think I have a pretty decent idea of what it is. What is score study? So I'm going to ask you that specific question. Think about that in the privacy of your own thoughts. And if you were in that undergraduate conducting class the other day, you already know the answer, or at least my answer to this. So you, Try to remember if you don't immediately have it on recall. What is score study? <clears throat> Anybody want to volunteer an answer on a Saturday morning? How um, how band directors practice for rehearsal. Okay, you were in the class on Thursday, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, you were. Okay. Yeah. I always see it as an envisioning of the sounds that are supposed to be intended by the composer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else? 
knowing what needs to happen, knowing it's going to be out of trouble. Absolutely. No question. As was already suggested, this is my personal definition for score study. I'm glad you remembered, so thank you. That makes me feel like an effective teacher that you remembered that two days ago, so thank you. This is my personal definition of score study. The way that we practice, we being music educators, before rehearsals. Now, I went to a clinic, my very first conducting symposium clinic, when I was probably not much older than most of you. And I vividly remember the way that the clinic started was with this demonstration <laughs> of a, what was purported to be an artistic release. In other words, you know, this person demonstrating this was showing that this was the, an inspired artistic way to release the ensemble from a musical perspective. Okay? So I don't even remember the piece, and it doesn't matter. But they were, they were conducting along, they get to the release, and this is what they said, they demonstrated this, this person, clinician, demonstrated this as this is the zenith of conducting gestures for releases. Okay, ready? <laughs> now, <laughs> just imagine, particularly those of you that are our colleagues out teaching public school right now, especially if you had middle schoolers or have middle schoolers. Can, can you imagine, <laughs> Melissa, right? Yeah, right? Melissa, can you imagine doing that gesture if, with your middle school band? They would have no clue. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I say, this is why I, I bring this point up, because the way that we practice as conductors, and I use that term as a macro term, is not through gestures. Now, let me put a disclaimer here. There are times that it's important to mechanically work out what we're doing gesturally. A, 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 the textbook example from my point of view is fermatas. When we get to a fermata, we've got three questions we have to answer. We have to answer how long does it last, we have to answer whether or not it continues or there's a break after the fermata, and then lastly, where our hands need to be to make sure that we can do all that. So that might take a little mechanical working out to practice all that. But I assure you that I don't know conductors and music educators that I respect that are pontificating in front of a mirror, boy, I can't wait till I use this one. It's far more important to be able to say something through score study. That's how we practice. That's how we practice. So, if you think about how you practice, this is another one of my favorite sayings, and the NMU kids have heard this a couple times, but but there's an infinite distance between zero and one. I love that saying. That's so true. You think about the way that you practice your own instrument. If I were to say to you, Daniel, this is the way you're going to practice. You'd be like, maybe, depending on the day, if it fits or if it's appropriate or whatever. But you probably have 10 other strategies that you would use for practicing. It's not just one thing that you're going to do. Friends, the same thing is true for score study. Okay? I, there are books that you can buy that prescribe this is how you do it. You know, you can go to clinics like these, get ideas, but ultimately, this is a personal decision. I hope that you take something away from this clinic, this particularly this portion of the clinic, that will inform your practice of score study. But I don't necessarily expect that you're going to do it exactly the way the guy from Arkansas did because it's a personal decision. It's a, it's a personal thing, the way that we practice. That said, I am comfortable in saying the following. This. Listening to recording ad nauseum is not score study. It, it is not. Now, let me clarify something. Because I get this question frequently. Do you ever listen to recordings while you're score studying? The answer is yes, I do but only for ideas, only for interpretation, only for, hey, the Marine Band did this and this with this piece, but yet the University of wherever did that and that and that with this piece. I wonder why. And you start to examine and make those decisions. Yeah, fine. But I don't use listening to a recording as a shortcut to learn the piece. Now, 
Maybe you listen to a piece to decide whether or not you're going to program it or not. Okay, that's fine. But it's not ever, you know, continual. You know, you have it on your favorite playlist on Spotify or whatever. Because every few minutes when you have a break, you're like, oh, that's my score system. No, that's not score system. Okay. So this is my. As a, I, I purposely, I apologize for the capital R research language there, but I have to feel like I have to clarify this to say. The way that I do it now here in 2019 is not the same way that I did it in 2009. It's not the same way that I did it in 1999. And in 1989, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but I can tell you that in probably 2029 and 2039, that my process is probably going to vary a little bit. Hence why I say my ever-evolving nonlinear score study practice. These are the six steps that I do when I approach a score. And we'll talk about each one of these particular steps. Pedagogical analysis. And by the way, I think Professor Seifert is going to make all of this available to you uh, through various media or whatnot. If you want to write that down, if you're a, a learner who does well with taking notes and that helps you learn, awesome. If you're a visual person, then don't take notes. You're not going to offend me at all because this material is going to be available to you. All right? So pedagogical. Historical and biographical, formal, and I don't mean formal as opposed to informal, I mean formal as in the form or architecture of the word. Harmonic, articulation and timbre, and then finally, synthesis. I'll give you a second, some of you are feverishly writing on a Saturday morning, so I'll give you a second to, to write that if you wish. Now, because there's an infinite distance between 0 and 1, I want to, to be clear right off the bat that I don't do 